Last week, we took a look at how AES encryption works, which is a very secure and very fast encryption algorithm that is used all over the world in many different applications. But the speed of AES, it doesn't just come from the fact that the algorithm is an optimized to be fast, but it also comes from the fact that it is a symmetric encryption algorithm. And this also allows it to churn through and encrypt or decrypt many gigabytes of data very, very quickly. However, there is one major limitation to symmetric encryption schemes, and that is the fact that they use a single key to encrypt and decrypt the data. And that would need to be shared amongst all of the people that need to retrieve the plain text data from its encrypted form. So these symmetric encryption schemes, they wouldn't really be appropriate for certain things like sending an email, for example, because you would have to first transmit your encryption key to somebody in plain text before you then send them an encrypted message for them to decrypt with that key. But if somebody is sniffing traffic on the network, and of course, if that network is the internet, if we're sending anything across the internet, you have to assume that somebody always is sniffing the traffic. Uh, so in that instance, they would be able to intercept that encryption key that you sent and use it to decrypt all of the encrypted messages that you transmit over the wire. So how can we get around this? Well, back in the day, you would have people that just met up in secret. They would probably meet up in person in order to exchange keys because they wouldn't want to give them over the phone or over a telegraph for fear of somebody listening in on them. It was possible uh, even on those networks to intercept somebody's encryption keys. But obviously, that solution isn't really going to work for trying to communicate to somebody that you're physically separated from or that it would be burdensome to meet up in, with in person, like if they're in another city or if they're on the other side of the world. So this is where asymmetric encryption or public key cryptography, as it's also called, comes into play. And the asymmetric encryption algorithm that we're going to take a look at today is RSA. So the name RSA, it comes from its creators. It's just created from their names. So uh, their creators are Ron Rivest, pictured in the middle here, and then Adi Shamir, posted on the left here, and Leonard Adelman over here on the right. And these guys are basically three cryptography geniuses uh, that came up with this algorithm. And the way that it works at a high level and kind of the way that all asymmetric encryptions work is that you have a private key. So we'll call that key A. And you want to keep this key a secret. So don't share it with anyone. You know, Don't tell anyone what it is. Make sure that there's no screenshots of it or anything like that. And then you have a public key. We'll call that key B, which you're going to give to anybody who you want to be in contact with. So put this in all of your signatures, You know, put it in the about section of your social media, uh, write it on a billboard, whatever you wanna do. So this public key is going to let your friends decrypt messages that you encrypted with your private key, uh, and of course, vice versa, and your friends they're also going to have their own key pair as well. So they'll have a private key and then you'll have their public key because again, that's going to be published everywhere. It's gonna be in the about section of all of their social medias. So if your friends wanted to send a message to you and we don't want anybody to eavesdrop on this message and we wanna make sure it's secure and we avoid the whole problem with AES key exchange like I explained earlier, they can just encrypt it with your public key. And the only key that can unlock that is your private key. So they can send it across the wire. No worries that anyone's going to be able to see it. And then you unlock it with your private key and you're able to see the message. And then when you want to reply, you use your friend's public key to encrypt your message. And again, only their private key is going to be able to unlock it. So the public key, it really kind of works more like a lock in this scenario, even though we still call it a key. Now, in the case of RSA, the messages that we're going to be encrypting is most likely just going to be the key to another encryption algorithm like AES. 
And the reason for this is that you can't actually encrypt a lot of information with RSA. You can only encrypt data whose size is less than or equal to your RSA key size, which is typically gonna be 248 bits or 256 bytes. So there's not a whole lot of wiggle room for there. Obviously, you wouldn't be able to send an email. Uh, you know, you could just create a text file and start typing out some words into it and see how many words you can get to in only 256 bytes. It's not a whole lot. But luckily, the maximum key size for AES is 256 bits. So RSA, it has more than enough bits to encrypt our AES key, uh, which is then going to be used to encrypt the body of the message since you know there's really no limit to how much data AES can encrypt. So we can have the body of our email, we can have all of our attachments and things like that be encrypted with AES. So then we can send that AES key, but it's encrypted with RSA along to our friend on the other side of the internet. So we're not running into that same problem that I mentioned earlier where you exchange the AES key because it's not being exchanged in plain text. Uh, in eavesdropper, they can't get anything from our key exchanges. So he has neither of our private keys. He can't unlock it. Uh, and of course, the body of the messages, they are encrypted with AES or a similar algorithm, so he can't get access to those either. Now, another interesting thing that you can do with RSA is you can encrypt data with your private key. Now, it should be obvious that you wouldn't want to do this for the purposes of privacy because your public key is public. It's out there for anyone to get, so a message that you encrypt with your private key is essentially available to anybody. But by doing this encryption with your private key, you can use it to prove the authenticity of a message because nobody else in the world is going to have your private key and anything that we are able to decrypt with that public key means that it must have been a message encrypted with your private key, i.e. it must have been a message that you sent. So what most modern systems do when they use RSA encryption is they'll use both keys to get the best of both worlds. So your message will be encrypted with your private key and then with your friend's public key before being sent to them. And that way both parties know that nobody else can read the message and that the messages are actually coming from the right person, there's no imposter that's here, and there haven't been any modifications to the message because of course that would require the keys. So how does this all work? Really, it's all based on prime numbers, which come up a lot in cryptography. Uh, so large prime numbers are also used in the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. But the cool thing about prime numbers is that if you multiply two of them together, the result is a number that can only be evenly divided by those two prime numbers and then of course itself and one because everything is divisible by itself and one. So let's say that you have a number like 5183. It would be pretty difficult for you to figure out what those numbers are divisible by, even with a calculator. Um, what you would probably do to basically brute force this on your own is you would start trying to divide by three and then seven and then 11. You would basically start uh, trying to divide by these different prime numbers and so on. And then eventually you would discover that these are divisible by 71 and 73 but you would still end up guessing a lot of different numbers. So if you factor together two very large prime numbers, much, much larger than 73 and 71, uh, it would take a really long time to reverse engineer that, even if you're using a supercomputer to do many, many guesses per second. And you're probably wondering at this point, just how large do these prime numbers have to be? Well, let's take a look at a certificate that I'm using with DuckDuckGo here. So we'll take a look at view certificate. And we'll scroll down here to the public key info. So we can see that our key size here, 2048, and that the algorithm is RSA. And the modulus, so here is our number here, but currently it's being displayed in uh, hexadecimal. So it's actually a little bit shorter. Uh, than it normally would be. I've uh, already converted this to 
decimal and written it out. And this is what it looks like. So very, very large number. It's about, what, 617 digits long. So yeah, you're not going to be able to guess the prime numbers that are used to create this, even if you're brute forcing it with a supercomputer. Uh, so this mechanism is essentially used to create the key pairs in a relatively fast way, but obviously it's going to be very slow and difficult to try and reverse it. Um, the prime numbers are also usually relatively far apart, so they won't be right next to each other like the 71 and 73 example from earlier. Uh, now, I am really, really simplifying the explanation here. There's a bit more to this algorithm than just simply picking two large prime numbers uh, and you know multiplying them together. If you're really interested in a more detailed explanation of the algorithm itself, I would recommend watching the two-part series of the RSA encryption algorithm on Eddie Wu's YouTube channel. Uh, so he goes into a lot of detail here about the algorithm and it's only about 20 minutes between uh, part one and part two. Uh, so it's a pretty good summarization of it even if you're not super knowledgeable about cryptography. Uh, but anyway, that's it for this video. Now you know how RSA encryption works. Hope you enjoyed.